This episode was made possible by CuriosityStream. Hello! Calculus is the mathematics of change. The word comes from Latin meaning small stone because it deals with problems where one big thing needs to be broken down into lots of little things. Without it, humans would never have left our own planet. Engineers use it to determine how much material they need for a job or how much power they should give a motor. Biologists use it to determine the rate of disease spread and chemists use it to measure reactions. But where did this magical tool come from? The earliest questions that calculus was invented to answer came in the form of paradoxes. In this video, we're going to look at three paradoxes that led to three key concepts in calculus. Zeno of Ilia, a 5th century BCE thinker, is known exclusively for a number of ingenious paradoxes. He had a strange but interesting view of the world. He thought that we couldn't trust our senses, but only logic, and invented a paradox to demonstrate this. If you want to travel one state, the distance covered in ancient Greek foot races, do you agree that you first must travel halfway there? Yes. Do you agree that you must travel to the halfway point between your current position and the one state mark before you reach the end? Yes, you need to go a further quarter of a state on your way to finishing your journey. But once you're there, there's another halfway point for you to reach, now an eighth of a state in front of you. Where are you going with this, Zeno? But then halfway again is a sixteenth of a state, and so on. Once you reach that halfway point, there'll be another one in front of you, no matter how far you go. Before you can reach your final endpoint, you must first reach the infinitely many half points that come before it. How do you manage that? It seems that what the logic is telling us is that the journey takes infinitely many steps to complete. Therefore it, and in fact all motion, is simply impossible. But you're moving right now. It's an illusion. While Zeno's conclusion isn't super convincing, it's difficult to pinpoint the flaw in his argument. Something about Zeno's logic has to be wrong. But what? Let's take a closer look. At the first halfway point, your total distance is equal to half a stage. Then once you reach the second halfway point, your total distance is that half plus a quarter of a stage. By the next halfway point, the pattern is clear, and we can write the total distance as a bunch of fractions added together. The numbers we're adding on keep getting smaller, but the sum never ends. There's an infinite amount of fractions to add on. And if a sum gets bigger every time you add on a fraction and you have an infinite amount of numbers to add on, shouldn't the total distance get infinitely large? And if a distance is infinitely large, surely you can never traverse it. This was one of the early problems that led to the invention of a mathematical tool that is the backbone of calculus the limit. Let's take a closer look at how this sum breaks down. The first two terms add to get 0.75, adding one more term gives us 0.875, and adding another gives 0.9375. The sum is just getting closer and closer to 1, and there doesn't seem to be any risk of it running off to infinity. Even though we have an infinite number of fractions to add, they seem to be approaching the number 1. We might make it to our final destination after all. But how do we know for sure? No matter how many terms we add on to the sum by hand, there will always be another one we can add on after that, and then another one, and another one, without actually ever reaching one. It's exactly this type of problem that the limit was created to deal with. To help us understand what the mathematical limit really means, let's rewrite the problem a little. We've been writing our total distance as a sum like this, but it can be written much more conveniently like this. Here's the derivation if you're interested. Written like this, this sum is much easier to work with. The n stands for the number of fractions or terms in our sum. The more terms there are, the larger n gets, which means that this term here, 2 to the power n, gets really, really large. The bigger 2 to the power n gets, the smaller the fraction gets, and the smaller the fraction gets, the closer the sum gets to equaling 1. And that logic is exactly what it means to take the mathematical limit. It never actually solves what happens at infinity, it just takes you arbitrarily close to infinity. Or another way to think of it is asking what happens on the threshold of infinity, just before we actually reach it. This idea is extremely useful in a lot of mathematics where we need to resolve what happens as a sum approaches a number but never actually reaches it. 
This idea of approaching something but never actually reaching it is the big idea at the heart of calculus. Which brings us to our next paradox. Our next paradox begins with trying to find the area of a shape. For simple and regular shapes like rectangles and circles, formulae for um, their areas have been around for thousands of years. But what about this shape? How would you go about finding its area? There's no neat formula. The shape doesn't even have a name. A mathematician named Bonaventura Cavalieri wondered if we could use the formula for shapes we already knew to calculate shapes we didn't know. For example, take this semicircle. It has a known area of half pi r squared. He imagined the semicircle as being made up of lots and lots of widthless lines and then created a new shape by only moving those lines up or down. The new shape is clearly different, but if you draw any vertical line, it will overlap with the old shape by the same amount that overlaps with the new one. As if both shapes are made up of the same vertical segments, this theory seems okay on the surface, but it has a few problems. For instance, let's try drawing a vertical line in this triangle. Because this triangle has the same height, it doesn't matter where we drew the line. We could slide that line horizontally across and find a spot where it fits in this triangle. But that suggests that the two shapes are made up of the same vertical lines. And if an area is just made up of many vertical lines, that would suggest that these triangles have the same areas, which we can see isn't true. This is a paradox. By definition, the line segments have zero width. They're one-dimensional objects determined only by their length. No matter how many zeros you add together, you always get zero. You can never get some actual size or area. Modern calculus uses this widthless line idea for inspiration for a more mathematically rigorous way of finding areas. Integration. We still break shapes up into vertical pieces, but those pieces no longer have zero width. So for example, if you want to find the area under a curve, you might start with an approximation. Maybe you draw a bunch of rectangles under the curve. All we have to do to find our area estimate is add together the areas of the rectangles we've drawn. This gives us a pretty decent guess, but it's only a guess because now we have to deal with something that we didn't run into with the line segments. There are gaps near the top of our rectangles where some of the area isn't being filled in. The simple solution to this is to make the rectangles narrower. We have to draw more of them, but once they're all drawn out, the open space near the curve has decreased. It's still an estimate, but it's closer to the actual area under the curve than our first estimate. In fact, what we'd really like to do is get as close to zero width as possible without ever actually getting there. Does this remind you of anything? Yes, limits. Instead of letting the width of the rectangles equal zero, we ask, what happens when we let the width approach zero? As the width of the rectangles approaches zero, the number of rectangles needed to fill the space approaches infinity. This technique is called integration um, because we're combining lots and lots of small things to create a larger whole. So here we've come full circle, from widthless lines to widthful lines, to infinitely close to being widthless lines. Okay, so this paradox is actually called Zeno's arrow, but I couldn't find a bow and arrow, so we've got a Nerf gun instead. Just think of this as the modern day version. So far we've dealt with paradoxes that consider how space is divided, but in this one, Zeno considers time. If you fire a Nerf bullet, it seems to glide through the air, moving the whole time, right? Well, let's take a closer look. What is it doing one second after it was fired? Intuitively, we want to say that it's moving, but if we freeze on that exact instant, can you actually show that it's moving? By definition, something that moves changes its position, but frozen in a single moment of time, it doesn't move at all. Like a movie, it's just a sequence of still photos, one after the other played very rapidly. Nothing is actually moving, it just gives the illusion of movement. Likewise, since you could have frozen the bullet at any point along its path, then when exactly does it move? How can a collection of motionless moments make up motion? 
This question seems pretty similar to our previous two paradoxes. So can we use what we've learnt and apply the same logic here? Let's start by trying to figure out the bullet's speed at any given time instant. Let's start with an easy case, where its speed is constant. This looks like a straight diagonal line on our distance versus time graph. You don't need to check each individual point, you just need to know the total distance travelled in a given time and divide the two numbers. Now let's say the motion of the bullet looks like this. It's not so simple as just taking the average because it's travelling different speeds at different points. So how do we find out its speed at a specific point? Let's say we want to know the speed at 5 seconds. We can pick two points, one a tiny bit before the 5 second mark and one a tiny bit after, and draw a straight line between them to get a very good idea of the speed at 5 seconds. As the two points get closer and closer together, the more accurately you'll be calculating the speed at 5 seconds. So what is the smallest gap? Well, it can't be zero because zero isn't a time interval, but it needs to be small, really small. Can you guess what we're about to do? Take the limit! As the distance between our two points approaches zero, this slope value that we're calculating approaches the tangent to the curve at a point. This is the derivative, and it's what we use to calculate what we're calling instantaneous speed. So there we have it. Three paradoxes which led us to three foundational pillars of calculus. Paradoxes are a great way for us to explore new ideas and challenge our intuition. Sometimes they turn out to be just tricks of logic with simple solutions, and in other cases they have a huge impact, changing the way we think and carrying on for centuries. Calculus confuses me in a philosophical sense. I was a big believer that math is a discovery, that we discover mathematical patterns in nature and use them to describe our world. But calculus seems purely man-made, an invention that doesn't exist anywhere but our minds. So is math an invention or a discovery? This question fascinated me so much that I made a feature video about it on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform built by a bunch of us educational YouTube creators where we can explore making different and experimental content. Curiosity Stream, a streaming service with award-winning documentaries, is so supportive of our idea that they're offering Nebula completely free when you sign up with them. In fact, there's a really cool documentary by Hannah Fry about this exact question of whether math is an invention or a discovery. It's visually beautiful, explores the history of math in a fun way, and Hannah Fry is just charming. I aspire to be like her one day. I watched the entire three hour series in one go, so if you do get the two for one deal, make sure to watch Hannah Fry's Magic Numbers and also my video on Nebula because I think it's pretty good. They're offering a 26% off holiday promotion at the moment. Sign up with the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash up and atom. That's it from me and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!